Shall we go on for another week? (laughs) (laughs) You've been an incredibly pleasant lot to be with (laughs) it. I thought, like, the word sati or mindfulness Here's some reflections on it. Uh, One is uh, orderly arrangement of the facts of life. (laughs) The sense of bringing into it the way things are, the facts of life, uh, and the uh, so it's 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 uh, it's establishing you know in your consciousness the way things are. Not on a judgmental plane, on, on how, on a, or compared to an ideal of how it should be, but just the way it is. Uh, so, like you say, I feel this way. This is how I feel. So then, you're, you're, you're whatever way you're feeling, you're noticing it. You see, rather than you than uh, thinking that, not noticing how you're feeling. Like if you're starting to meditate, and you just go into your practice like this. You know you. You're not aware, maybe, of, of the, the mood or the, the state of your, your body or whatever is, is affecting that. And you can, you, because we're so uh, he- up in our head, we can just will ourselves, you know, I've got to meditate and go into full lotus posture and sit there and then wonder why it's so utterly miserable. Because you, you know, and then take it all and just trying to, to kind of knock it out through an act of will. Where I say with with sati, you know, you're observing the the breath, the the posture. You're aware of the mood of the mind. You know, like people say, you know, I can't do anapanasati, and and uh, because they, you know, they they go they go to work, they work in London, they have to talk on the telephone, type, and greet people, and get caught up in the worldly affairs of people and then they go home and then they want to sit and go into Anapanasati. And this woman said, well, I can't do it. I just, I've tried for years. And I said, of course, I mean, you can't, how can you expect to, to just suddenly, you know, go into your flat, close the door and then sit down and go into a state of bliss over the <laughs> mindfulness of the breath? And you notice what your mind's like, how they, like talking on the telephone or how does that affect your mind? Like if you have to talk all day or if you if you're at a computer or these different things have an effect on your mind, and so mindfulness is bringing awareness of the effect. Not it's not complaining about it or saying it shouldn't be. It's just noting the way it is. Because then, you, once you establish this, then you can, you know, you, you realize that you can. That that's one of the things. That that's part of one's karma that one has to accept and be patient and allow these things to, to. To, uh, to to go, you know, in their own time without you kind of just barging your way into your consciousness and saying, I want bliss right now. And then feeling frustrated, think you can't meditate because you can't make it all happen the way you'd like it. The second one is the sati, the priorities and relationships. And you notice they established Mindfulness around very neutral things at first, like the, the breath and the body. Like with Anapanasati, you don't have to go into samadhi with it, but it's, it's a grounding thing to start bring attention just to the breathing of the body because it's a, it's a, it's part, it's a physio- physiological process in the posture of the body, the body itself. You're grounding yourself on things that you don't, that aren't vanity or or highly, per- you don't personalize them. They just functions that, that you don't you don't have a, a personal identity with. So priorities in relationships. The third is the prerequisites for concentration. Fourth, mind full of right things in the right proportion, which leads to samadhi. So that you're aware of of uh, of the subtleties of of mental states, you know, and you're you're aware of of uh, the, the 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 flux and changingness of them, rather than 
and having fixed views and 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 very fixed assumptions. Uh, memory of one's own reality. Um, you know, to to remember the the way it is for you as an as a as an individual person, Re- reminding of our own true self, reminding of our Buddha nature, to remind yourself the true nature of things is the deathless, the amata dhamma, the the uh, rather than the condition as as so so mindfulness is also. Reminding yourself, like in the, when you take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, that's that's a reminder. That's a mindful reflection. I take refuge in the Buddha, which is that pure universal knowing, pure universal intelligence that you connect to when you let go of uh, just the conditioned, uh, desiring mind. And then uh, the Dhamma is is the truth of the way it is. So. You're, you're reminding yourself like this in the sense of refuge, uh, Bhutang Sarnangachami, in that is taking Buddha to refuge. You're taking pure knowing, pure awakeness, universal intelligence as your refuge. So that's your true nature. It's not personal anymore, though, is it? It's not like my true nature is Buddha. Then it gets into that doesn't work. It, that's why. That's why in Theravada they deliberately avoid using words like Buddha nature and things because people tend to grasp the concepts. But in uh, in uh, and that becomes an obstacle to. But they like in the sense of re- I found the sense of refuge very useful because it's part of a very kind of the basic uh, kind of ABCs of Theravada Buddhism is I take refuge in the Buddha, Buddha <laughs> and uh, and so I mean it's so kind of basic. Sometimes it's overlooked. I've just said in the in the kind of well that's what Theravadins uh, do when they perform ceremonies. It's a kind of ceremonial recitation, or you can see that it's not just it's not meant to be merely a uh, some kind of, you know, hanging on to Pali language and and uh, Buddhist ceremony, but it actually is pointing to to what the, the true nature of things. Buddha as a refuge, Dhamma as a refuge, knowing the the Buddha, knowing the the Dhamma, the way things are. And again, I emphasize that relationship of Buddha to Dhamma is is the paradigm that we're all functioning from, the subject to object. In the, it, that's that's the the paradigm that is that that the pattern, the basic pattern that we're all involved in. Being born conscious beings on this planet is the is the subject object experience. We're all experiencing life. The objects of life touch us or impinge on us on this subject. So, but instead of it being you know, we, we take it personally and and, and, and um, we distort it through not understanding it. It becomes complicated and distorted and problematic for us. But when we when we put it in that proper paradigm of the awakened mind to the way things are, that's mindfulness, isn't it? The, the Dhamma is the way things are. The truth is the way it is. So then the, then the Dhamma is uh, pointing to the universal pattern of a conditioned realm, sabe sankara anicca. All conditions are impermanent. So that that takes care of everything you can think of, including the thought itself. <laughs> and then sabe tama anatta is the is the all dhamma is not self. So that's the, we're not trying to identify with the idea of being immortal. You see that it's, it's such a direct teaching. You're, it's taking out every possibility of attachment to, to, uh, to doctrines or, or doctrinal positions or teachings. 
so that the the uh, sape dhamma anatta that the dhamma is both the uh, the uh, sankata a sankata dhamma which is the conditioned and the unconditioned so that the this is this is not self the conditioned dhammas uh, the the five khandas and all this is not self anatta and then the then the unconditioned, the asankata dhamma, is not self. We're not trying to hold on to a view of of ourselves like a, a, the Atman idea of Atman in Hinduism. The Buddha didn't like to use that term because one tended to attach to to it. Believe in an Atman, and be, or you know, believe in a Buddha nature, or believe in a, that that our true nature is immortal. Uh, as, a, as a kind of belief system rather than in a realization of it. So the Buddha is pointing at, at a direct realization of truth rather than a, than a, uh, a metaphysical uh, doctrinal description of truth. It says here, remind us of our Buddha nature or and the ego makes us forget our true nature. The ego, doesn't it? We we get caught up in the in all the problems of ourselves and fears and desires and we forget the true nature of things. We get carried away with the little things, little personal things, little annoyances or big things all become, you know, very complicated problems for us. To remove the egotistical layers is sati, and to and and true remembrance. True remembrance. So this word remember uh, is is because the the avicca or the ignorant state is forgetting that where we we forget the two nature things we forget the truth the dhamma the Buddha the dhamma the sangha we are caught in the in just the force of habit and the, and the power of delusion and greed, hatred, so forth, and this, and so we, through that forgetting, we we we're caught in these in just the momentum of of these habits, and then we remember. So sati is remembering, bringing back into our consciousness the way the way things are. Now we're not trying to convince ourselves of that our true nature is immortal, is not believing in the, not making a doctrine out of it. But uh, this is for reflection. It, it, well, I think in, like in a lot of the Vipassana uh, teachings, they, they emphasize uh, a technique and, and practice so much, they don't realize that most Westerners don't have a refuge. And it becomes too, like more like psychotherapy rather than than uh, a real spiritual journey. So, and then one needs to have, have this, to, to know the way things are and to, to have this, this sense of refuge is, is uh, where you feel you can, you can, you have the courage to step out into the unknown to look at things. Your refuge is in, is in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and so then and as that begins to sink in and, and become, and as you understand and realize the Dhamma more and more, then, then you become more and more courageous because you, you realize there's nothing to fear. But if it's merely on a kind of psychotherapeutic level, then you, there's a lot you can't really look at because it, it's, because you, you, you can't, you, you still, you're still bound into an ego and a sense of yourself as being, as being your refuge, your own kind of views and opinions about practice as being your real refuge rather than the, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Any questions? Or comments? Yes? You said something about I am consciousness. To me, the answer is that I 
Well, to, to do to work with that now, just to be aware of it, like you're aware of it, and as you you, you can, I mean, don't you know? Just as you, you know, have the, have the have the faith in the practice, so that this that awareness and with the sense of claustrophobia that you feel now, try to to look at that in, a, in with sati, bring it into your consciousness rather than just. You don't try to suppress it, or to analyze it. You know, you can spend your time thinking, "Why am I claustrophobic, and what's wrong with me?" Because if I were normal, I wouldn't. And that you don't need to to do that, but to just know the feeling of it, the the mood of it, the emotion of it, and just to 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 begin to look at it and accept it for what it is, rather than to to try to get rid of it, or, or cure yourself of that terrible problem. It's all right to have it, you know, so you can, you can begin to, to uh, you know, look at it in a, in, a, in a cool and objective way, a kind of accepting way. Then when your turn comes to die, you probably, you know, you've already, you're, you're, you're already in the flow of your consciousness, so you the ideal is, you know, by the time it, you know, we die, then we're the mind is 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 not is no more in doubt. I mean, where people get frightened in death is where they never never come to terms with it. And before the moment comes, or before the dying process starts taking place, and then it then you know that then that. That must be very terrifying if you if you've not prepared yourself, and it's just and suddenly you find yourself in there and it's happening and then what all you can do is maybe panic. Well, not having died yet, you see. I <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak from an experience of death. But death would be the end of consciousness in this form. You know, like the, this body no longer operates as a conscious form, then it starts decaying. So, uh, and, and there's, and one, you know, you hear of cases where people have been, uh, like, uh, in in uh, like in a kind of vegetative state for years, and no, and think and people think they they aren't conscious, and yet when they come back into normal behavior, they they know what was going on. I mean, it's, it's interesting to uh, people who've had near death. Ex- have you ever talked to anyone who's had near death experiences? Or they they they've had they've seen themselves die, and then they. And then they uh, they leave their bodies and they see themselves lie their body lying dead, and then they tend to they have this and they're all very similar when people have these they they find themselves being attracted to this light and they go toward that and it's very blissful and then then they uh, they hear these cries and weeping and wailing and they they see all their family you know begging them to come back so they they have to come back. To finish out their lives, so they, in the, so they, some people have these experiences, but they, but they, they actually like out of the body, they, they're, they're conscious of, of this, this happening. No, it's, it's, I've never had one of those experiences. So I, I'm just 
some people have told me about them, but um, you realize that that uh, that our perception of uh, and the way we tend to see the universe and the world we live in is 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 is, is not really the way it is. And so we, 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 you know, we're so fixed in our own kind of uh, perception of ourselves and the world as a kind of, this is the real world, and, and we have a, we like to kind of hold on to it in a, in a, in a solid kind of form that gives us a sense of, we know what it's all about. But the more you meditate, the more you realize you don't know. You don't know what it's all about. It's very mysterious. It's quite miraculous, and and uh, and that uh, that all the desires you want to you know to, to kind of encapsulate it and to kind of hold it in a in a form that you can can see and and approve of and agree on. Instead, we end up. What happens is we we allow ourselves to open to the unknown, so that in in uh, in meditation and in, in refuge in Dhamma, we're we're allowing ourselves to not know things. We're not trying to know things anymore, or figure it all out. So so that a, a lot of the 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 development of the path is the willingness to just be open and receptive, rather than to figure it out. And and if you notice that that state of open receptivity is is uh, usually quite frightening or difficult for us because there's such a desire to 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 know things to have a perception for them to have a verification uh, to to have a description a definition and and the the insecurity unsurety uncertainty tends to make us very you know we feel threatened and, and ill at ease with it so in meditation we're learning to to be at ease with with emptiness with with uh, with non grasping with the kind of with uh, with the unsurety the uncertainty the uh, of that, that we that we experience so in uh, you know just to to uh, we're not trying to define and categorize and fix everything in, into a system of uh, of beliefs, but opening to the to the mystery to allow the mind to be receptive and embracing of 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 that which we can't know. And then, because of that, then then the, then there's a kind of revelation or a realization or insight takes place. Which is ineffable. It's it's not the kind of you call it to be experienced individually by the wise. So, bhajja tang we ti da po we It's uh, it's something that each one of us can realize and experience. But it's it's ineffable. It's not something you can you can describe. His description is is uh, dependent on. The uh, imperfect imperfection of language and language is conditioned in, in of the mind, and we're we're getting outside the, just the, uh, the just the conditioning uh, thinking of the mind. But by by the kind of. Uh, Continu- you know, continuous practicing, we we keep breaking down the the certainty of the conditioned world because the the ignorant being usually feels the conditioned world is the real world. It's the you know it's the the. Uh, You know, it's the personalities, the the rela- personal relationships, the professions, the the identities, the political systems, the 
economic systems and the social systems and the uh, mundane life of, you know, paying off your mortgage, having children. Uh, these are the, the, the fixed things of life regarded as the real world. This is reality. And, and that's why people cling to that dimension so strongly because it, it, uh, it, is, it does have a, a sense of, of reality to us in the, on the level of our human experience. And, and it, uh, not to deny its importance or its power, but, to, but, but we tend to, if we just fix on that, alone, then we're, we're merely caught in the conditioned realm. We have no, you know, we don't, uh, we, 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 and the conditioned realm will always uh, be disappointing to us. I mean, talk to people with about their families, and uh, this is always uh, Coronation Street <laughs> melodramas. The story of, you know, there's not exaggeration. I hear, you know, really more exciting stories than Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> About, you know, difficulties of people's lives. And uh, wanting, you know, the, and, and so that this, this, uh, this uh, conditioned realm is, is if, if that's all we ever open to, ever ever regard as reality, then, of course, when it, it goes off, it may be, a, you know, you can control it or enjoy it for some time, but it, it's very, you can't, uh, you can't, you can't make it into a, into a utopian, eternal experience, and it's subject to sudden change, disruption, and all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, we reflect on. We'll be separated from me. And that's true, you know, when you contemplate that, we're, we're all going to have to be separated from what we love. It's a part of the human experience. And uh, it's just, that's part of the game, really. And yet there's this there's this fear of that, so there's a, a kind of desperate clinging. Will you love me forever? And promise me, that, you know, and the hope of, of of living happily ever after, the kind of fairy tale world of of uh, you know the child, where you know everything, you you end up in a kind of paradise with mummy and daddy, and and everything's rosy. Is a, is a kind of fantasy life of, of a condition et- of, of eternal condition happiness. But in actual mindfulness, you're really, that's not the way things are. That's a, that's a perception of fantasy that one can be attached to. But the way things are is that there's a lot of uncertainty in every moment of our lives. There's, uh, you know, we're, that 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 uh, everything is uncertain, unsu- uh, unknown. So then we go to that. What is it like to not know things? Mm-hmm. And uh, some some of the methods they use for that, like the koan in the Zen, where they give you impossible problems to solve. Where your mind is non plus, it just packs up your thinking mind because it can't, it can't find the answer. Or either who am I practice, you know, Ramana Maharshi, or the, this, these kind of, these kind of uh, means in which you, you ask yourself a question and, and then you note the, 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 the gap in the mind before you, you struggle to answer it, that space. Because you're, you're, you're beginning to see the way of, of, the, of not knowing. Because you're establishing your mindfulness in, that, in those gaps, in the 
interstices in the in the space of the mind rather than in the than just be caught in the condition going from one condition to the next then the uh, doubt the fifth hindrance the fifth uh, nivarana vichikicha I one uses a lot that where where you know the the uh, the doubting mind, because then doubt your mind, your thinking mind stops when you when you have a doubt. You watch. Now, what was the name of that person? And then you, for a moment there, if you notice the the thinking mind, the thoughts aren't there. You become aware of, of and you can use use doubting as a as a skillful means to bring into consciousness the the mind where there's no thought in it, the empty mind. And then the, the aim isn't just to really answer the question, but to note the, that the, the, the emptiness of mind. Or I used, I used to use uh, the, the space around the, the words, like I deliberately think something. I am a human being, a kind of thought that doesn't arouse any any real uh, emotion, and so then you you deliberately you determine to think this, and but you're aware that you're thinking it, and but you're noting before you think, and when you're just about to think, I, I, then there's a space. You note the space, am, and then there's another space, a. Another space, human, another space, being, and then there's, that's the end, that space there. So you're, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of training yourself to, to know, to bring, to inform consciousness of, of the, the, the space around the words. Because we don't notice that. You know, we're so caught up in thinking, 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 words, 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 words. One thing goes on to the next. <laughs> well, we are, these are upayas, they're skillful means, so that you're, you're, you're really tuning in to, because there's awareness, you know, there's, there's sati, you're reflecting, you're recollecting this, you're listening, and the sound of silence helps, the, 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 the ringing sound. Because then the, the thinking mind, can, you can stop thinking, you can just be hearing. And so you're, you're noting that and, and recalling that more and more. Because that, that, will, then you're, that will give you uh, perspective on the conditioning of your mind, the thinking process, and the emotional reactions you have. Like thoughts go very quickly, don't they? But but emotional reactions have a kind of inertia to them. They they kind of hang on you. Like you get some bad news. Like somebody says, uh, you between one of the meditations, you phone home and say, "How's everything?" And somebody says. <gasps> This terrible thing happened today, and then you have to come in, uh, you know, in this state of having had bad news, and sit down. Sit down here. And that this this kind of may maybe you know this sense of of anxiety is hanging in your mind, And of course, it goes into thought. It will, the thoughts will come out of that. And what I'm thinking about that, and or you can begin to observe just the the feeling or the mood of that anxiety, and, and begin to just stay with that till it till it drops away, letting letting it go. That's that's skillful way of dealing with emotion emotions. But you've also got to be very honest not to to do it to get rid of them. 
this is where we, we deceive ourselves. We oftentimes pick up these ideas. And, yeah, that's a way of getting rid of that awful emotion. And be mindful of it. And, then, and you're really not mindful. You're, you're, you're not mindful of the fact that, that you're doing it in order to get rid of it. And that doesn't work. So, so that's why you have to, it's better to kind of accept it. Welcome it, like with the metta practice. Welcome it. I found now a way of welcoming these kind of experiences where, where you have to deal with maybe anxiety or disappointment or doubt in, in your, in your, and you can sit there and you can use it as a skillful means just by noting, by accepting the, the mood of the mind. And willing to to feel it, totally feel it, and and have it for what it accept it for what it is, and be willing to feel it completely. And then you then you witness it's it's uh, it's it's uh, resolution. It goes away. And if you do that, then then the, the mind is very peaceful. Then, like in. When, when, when you've let go of those things, then the mind naturally goes to its pure, pure, its pure state of peacefulness. That's why in the chant, Anicca Vada Sankara, in the chanting at funerals and that, and so, all conditions are impermanent, they arise and pass away, and in their passing is peace. It's pointing to the ultimate reality that conditions when we let go of the conditioned realm, then then that letting go is uh, is uh, is where where the, there's the realization of peace. Peace. Everything is resolved in in the in the in the immortal Dhamma, the truth of the way it is, which is ineffable. You can't you can't hold it in your in the palm of your hand and say this is it. So note that, say, the wanting to know everything is is a kind of desire, wanting to have it all explained, having it all rationally, logically figured out, and uh, and having it verified by great teachers and authorities and or God or something. You know, wanting always some some external authority to to verify this. Can women be enlightened? I've done tomato. <laughs> they, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a woman, find out. Well, can they or can they? Tell me. <laughs> but since most people aren't really up to understanding that, you have to say, well, yes, women can get enlightened. They're just if they need the, co- the kind of... Uh, uh, sometimes we need that from somebody, you know, some kind of confirmation. But ultimately, we have to let go of that need for confirmation, affirmation from external sources. And so it's a, that's where we, because that, is, that, that binds us into still that, that, kind of, that relationship of, uh, there's still that de- delusion there, that, that, uh, that the truth is that you don't know the truth and that you can't. You've got to. have got to make sure that this authority confirms it. And, and there's still there's still this doubt that, that still uh, one has to has to work through. And that's why in the in the uh, in the in the emptiness or this this sense of not knowing, like Ajahn Chah's Maina teaching, he's. He's always saying, my now, my now, which in time means 
uncertain, don't know, unsurety. And uh, people would, you know, come to Ajahn Chah and, and always want him to kind of affirm everything. Say, my name. <laughs> I remember when first in 77 when we came, Christmas Humphreys, uh, who was alive and the founder of the Buddhist Society, heard we were, uh, invited us to Wessex celebration in, uh, in London. And uh, so Christmas Humphreys came, to, we were living in Hampstead, Bihar in those days, and invited Ajahn Chah, and he was, Ajahn Chah couldn't speak English, so I was translating, and, and, uh, and Ajahn Chah was, uh, 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 Christmas Humphreys would say, would you come to the Wesak day on such, such, uh, and Ajahn Chah kept saying, my man, I kept saying, he doesn't, he's uncertain about it. <laughs> <laughs> And Christmas Humphreys said, uh, can't he make up his mind? You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ajahn Chah wouldn't budge an inch. Uh, he was determined. <laughs> and so finally Christmas Humphreys said, well, I will send my car. And so the day came and, and uh, the car arrived and and so I, I went to Ajahn Chah and I said, and Ajahn Chah wouldn't say anything to me either whether he was going or not. <laughs> and so I went, to, so I said, the car is here to take us to the West Sac Day celebration. And he said, oh, let's go. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think Mr. Humphreys really understood that for, <laughs> understood it that well, but but when Bachar was really, ex- was uh, you know, uh, the future, he said the future is the unknown. And uh, I mean, when the conditions are there, then he <laughs> does it. 